Hi, everyone. We're going to start in a few minutes, OK? So um, if you're ready, we'll go. Ready? OK. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sandy Plowden, and on behalf of CSUN Center on Disabilities, I would like to officially welcome you to the 35th Annual CSUN Assistive Technology Conference. I want to sincerely, really thank all of you for joining us this year for not only supporting us and the community, but fellow presenters and attendees and exhibitors. It has been a challenging few weeks for everyone, and all of us at CSUN really appreciate your patience and cooperation as we took the time to consult with internal and external colleagues to consider all the options and make the informed decisions surrounding this year's event. It's always our goal and our number one priority to help make your conference a most successful one. So as a special thank you to you, I am not going to give you my usual spiel. <laughs> Wait. And not like everybody listens to me anybody, anyway. But somebody else may do it. So let's get started. And without further ado, because I've always wanted to say that, I would like to introduce you to tonight's host. Dr. William Watkins, Vice President of Student Affairs at CSUN. Dr. Watkins has been Vice President since 2010. He serves on the President's Cabinet and provides leadership to 11 departments and units in the Student Affairs Division, as well as oversight to the University Student Union and the Associate Students Incorporated. In his role as Dean of Students, he is an advocate for students, supporting the well-being, promoting ethical development, and enforcing the student conduct code. Dr. Watkins is an alumnus of Cal State Northridge, and while an undergraduate, he was elected student body president, the first African American to hold that position. He also received prestigious outstanding graduate senior award. He was awarded a scholarship to the University of Southern California where he earned a master's degree in public administration. He then went to UCLA, where he earned a doctorate in education leadership. In a little while, you're going to hear about the Strzokhi Leadership Award, named for the former Vice President of Student Affairs, who has supported Dr. Harry Murphy when he created the conference and the Center on Disabilities. Harry is going to give you a little bit more information but I just hope that you'll understand when he tells you all that, you realize why I consider Dr. Watkins my Fred Strachey, especially this year. So please join me in welcoming my boss, Dr. William Watkins, our 2020 program host. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 35th Annual Assistive Technology Conference. Now, you cheer at the conference. How about a cheer for Sandy? I have had the, the good fortune of working with her very directly over this past year. And I thought I knew how this conference came about. But watching Sandy and her team over the last several weeks, I, I'm sure you can all imagine uh, the experience of making a decision about hosting this conference and how we might do it in a way that might be of value to you as conference attendees and uh, addressing all of those who weren't able to come. And so I, I just can't tell you how proud I am of her. Uh, this is the kind of an environment and set of decisions that no matter which way you turn, there's going to be someone who has a different perspective about things. But St Sandy and her team have just continued to plow forward and to ensure that we are here this evening. So let's just give her just one more cheer for her great work. Thank you, Sandy. So it's uh, been my pleasure to attend this conference for a number of years. 
And on every other occasion, I've had the chance to, uh, to be where you are this evening. It's kind of a different view up here. Um, so it's an honor for me to be able to, to serve as your host. The conference continues to be one of the university's signature events uh, and one that we are always very proud of each and every year. Pardon me. Uh, it's still the longest running uh, and only university sponsored conference in this field with the added value of our science and research journal. And although this year's attendance may not be as large as we are accustomed to, we still consider ourselves the largest conference of this type in the world. CSUN is still uh, where industry leaders and stakeholders collaborate and researchers, um, uh, researchers, consumers, and practitioners, government representatives and the like come uh, for amazing speakers, uh, exhibitors, and the like. I encourage you to take advantage of the fact that um, of our unique circumstances today, you were able to kind of spread out. Those of you who have come to this event in the past know that this place would just be jam-packed and you would try, so you can just relax tonight. You'll be able to relax in all of the events uh, that you, you attend uh, during the time here. Make sure you are engaged in networking. Uh, all that being said, I do want to acknowledge the obvious, which is that uh, for a host of reasons, uh, some of our colleagues were not able to be with us this year. Uh, we've talked to individuals who wanted to come, and, and they, some of them worked for companies that uh, really were not permitting travel. We understand all of those situations, and we're trying to work for, uh, forward in trying to accommodate uh, individuals in that regard. But you are here, and this conference is about you and those who have come. So I'm told that I need to, to at minimum, go through a few um, dimensions of hygiene things. You guys have been hearing this list of things for some time now, so let me let you hear them again. Everyone should try to minimize close contact, such as handshakes and hugs. Now, there's a lot of fist bumping going on and a lot of kicking of feet and what have you. Maybe you'll come up with some other ways of greeting one another. I'm from Student Affairs, and I really am having a problem with the fact that I can't hug all of you. This is what we do in Student Affairs, but I'm constraining myself. We uh, ask that you try to uh, stay six feet or more away from others who may exhibit some signs of illness. Uh, of course, wash your hands, soap, 20 seconds, sing whatever song you're going to sing, but do your hand washing bit. Um, we have uh, tremendous staff here at the hotel who will be moving about and cleaning up and wiping over surfaces to make sure that they are as clean as possible. And if you're sick, we certainly invite you to remain in your room, uh, contact your physician or allow us to know if we can assist you so that we can ensure that you are taken care of, cover your coughs, However you do that, arms, what have you, but just not on each other. And, you know, if there are any life-threatening emergencies or anything of that kind, uh, they, we've had a lot of conversation with the hotel staff here, and we want you to know that we'll be able to take care of you here. So I've said those things. Um, and again, those of you who do events and activities on a college campus in particular, you probably have that same list of admonishments that you're sharing. And I do want to give uh, a very big shout out to all of you who um, came here with us uh, on this occasion. Um, travel has not been easy for, for most of you. Uh, and again, all of us are thinking about ways in which we can have a fabulous experience and to leave this experience safe. We do want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for continuing to sustain this conference. Now, uh, for one more official welcome, I'd like to introduce you to our president, uh, Dr. Diane F. Harrison, who uh, unfortunately was unable to, to be here. She is having eye surgery and was unable to uh, join us for this occasion. But there is a video. So let's see our president's greeting to you, Dr. Diane Harrison. Welcome to the 35th California State University Northridge Assistive Technology Conference. I'm Diane Harrison, president of CSUN, and on behalf of the University and Center on Disabilities, we are delighted to host this conference. I regret I cannot join you today, but I did want to extend to all of you 
My Personal Greetings. From its beginning in 1985, this event has been a center for the exchange of ideas about cutting-edge technologies designed to improve the lives of those with disabilities. Since this year also marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, I think it is appropriate to remember the role of people like you, our colleagues and our partners in the field, in keeping up with our rapidly changing world. I am proud to note that CSUN's Center on Disabilities is a pioneer in this regard, long committed to the vision of an inclusive society where people of all abilities have the chance to achieve their goals and experience success. The Center nurtures learning and innovation through training and research to improve the world for people with disabilities. The CSUN Assistive Technology Conference showcases the latest technology and practical solutions to facilitate the full participation of persons with disabilities in our society. This event truly provides an inclusive setting for researchers, practitioners, exhibitors, end users, speakers, and other participants to share the latest knowledge in the field of assistive technology. I know that everyone here and those watching our live stream will have a rewarding kickoff to this week's events, starting with the keynote address on advancing technology for people with disabilities that will be delivered by Dr. Rory Cooper. Over the next several days, I am sure you will gain new insights from the impressive educational program, including featured presentations from the Coleman Institute of Cognitive Disabilities and sessions in the journal track that will be published in the eighth volume this spring. And I encourage everyone to visit the exhibit hall at the conference for an up-close and hands-on experience with assistive technology. On behalf of everyone at California State University Northridge and the Center on Disabilities, I hope you have a rewarding and enlightening experience. About a cheer for our president. <laughs> she is indeed uh, quite, quite a supporter of this conference. Uh, whenever she talks about the university and sources of distinction for our university, this is really one of those marquee things that she makes reference to. So her comments are indeed uh, genuine. Now I'd like to introduce someone who is still, as we call it, call him the main man of this event, the founder of the Center on Disabilities and the creator of the CSUN Conference, Dr. Harry Murphy, who will present the Fred Strachey Leadership Award to Terry Hartman Squire. Dr. Murphy, come forward. On this night, we honor two leaders in the field, Dr. Fred Strachey, for whom this award is named, and Terry Hartman Squire, that's T-A-R-I, Hartman Squire, the recipient of the award for 2020. First, a few words about Fred. You did hear a little bit. Uh, he was Vice President of Student Affairs at the time this conference was conceived and he remained in that position for about another 15 years or so. Now, I have been recognized as the founder, but if I am the founder, Fred is the father of this conference. I say that because none of us would be here tonight without Fred. 36 years ago, 36 years ago, there was a year of planning. As I dreamed up a new conference on technology and disability, he was the one who had to give the green light because planning and execution meant resources, <clears throat> time, money, personnel. I told him quite clearly, I had no idea that this conference would be a success. He rolled the dice with me. 
And here we are, 35 years later. Fred retired, moved to London, where his wife was the head of the Pepperdine University study abroad. He was there for about 10 years. And my wife, Debbie, and I visited him there five or six times over the years. He was always interested in keeping up with the activities of the conference and always applauded those named as recipients of the award in his name. I told him that this year we had an especially worthy recipient in Terry Hartman Squire. Fred and his wife are now happily retired to Honolulu. Tough life. <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> There are many styles of leadership. <laughs> there is one uh, where a person might be very visible, who commands a lot of attention to his or her own activities. This was not Fred. He was a humble person, and his unique leadership quality was this. He was a leader who created other leaders. We now come to Terry Hartman Squire. I have known Terry for a very long time. Now, one of these remarks coming up is uh, from someone who knows her uh, not as long, but even better. I spoke to her husband, Jason Squire. He cannot be here tonight because he is teaching a class in the School of Cinematic Arts at USC. Her alma mater, my alma mater, William's alma mater, and I hasten to add, another alma mater, all three of us, is CSUN. <laughs> we are all grads of CSUN. Uh, Jason will soon have a video of this, I understand. So Jason, thank you for your help. I quote Jason, Jason. She is a, put, she is a pit bull disguised as a pussycat. <laughs> she is a pit bull disguised as a pussycat. That's hard to say. Maybe I should just stop there and be done. That might sum up the whole thing. But wait, there is more. Terry has corporate and nonprofit interests through her company, Einsof, E-I-N-S-O-F. She informs me that that's a Hebrew term that loosely equates to make the world a better place. And this is her North Star. Corporations like Apple, AT&T, CBS, and Colgate Palmolive reach out to Terry when they want to create innovative and effective engagement with the disability market and labor segments. She says her mission is to create communities, and she is the biggest networker among communities of persons with disabilities that I have ever, ever seen. She's the founding executive director of the Media Access Office, and through her many efforts has especially been a champion of placing people with disabilities into prominent positions in the entertainment field. <clears throat> and through her organization, Lights, Camera, Access, she endeavors to place qualified people in front of a camera, behind the camera, as writers, producers, directors, and executives. In the spirit of Fred Strachey, whose mission in life was to create other leaders, this year's superb choice to receive the award in his name is Barry Squire Hart. This is for you. <laughs> that is beautiful. Well earned. <laughs> Congratulations. Sweetheart. Can We're we gonna do hug. This? We're gonna hug. We've known each other for a hundred years. For, for hundred years. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Harry. Whoops. Uh, it's gorgeous. This means so much as a CSUN alumni, especially coming from you, Harry. Where are you, Harry? Go back there. there you are. Okay. From you, Harry. 
My first mentor, who I met through my brother Michael, when you headed up the CSUN Center on Deafness, which was before you headed up the CSUN De Center on Disabilities, that sparked your idea to start this glorious annual international conference. Let's applaud Dr. Harry Murphy, founder of this conference 35 years ago. <laughs> And let's face it, it's good to have a doctor in the house this year anyways. I learned important lessons at CSUN, although you'd never guess that from my GPA. Harry headed up an interpreter training program, and while my signing wasn't great, that wasn't a reflection on their ability not to teach, it was my inability to learn, so um, I didn't continue with that program. But I did learn a lot at CSUN from Harry, and that program that helped standardize the emerging profession of interpreters with plain blue smocks, no earrings, no fancy nail polish. And the theme was not to call attention to yourself, that you were of service to a deaf client and only there to facilitate communication. That's it, period. You know the disability anthem, nothing about us without us? Well, this was nothing about us. And that's a true leadership that I learned from CSUN, that it's not about being out in front. It's about being behind the scenes, facilitating communication, not calling attention to yourself, and being of service, and empowering others to strategize, mobilize, innovate, and push their ideas forward. So I did take those lessons to heart at CSUN as a non-disabled ally who serves and answers to a higher authority, which are authentic disability community leaders. And that's the hallmark of my company, AINSOF, as a media, business, and disability strategist for some 30 years. I started when I was five. <laughs> so as you know, since the beginning, the CSUN International 18 AT conference, which was an idea of Harry's, has always been a think tank, an incubator. This year it's like a petri dish, but it's more, <laughs> and, and you probably feel right at home, Harry, because you, when you retired, you went on, you do speaking gigs on cruise lines, right? So, so I hope you're gonna stop that for a while. So for those of you that aren't here in person, um, we miss you. Um, there's a new entertainer this year, the mask singer. Sorry. Um, it's a joke, guys, you can laugh. Uh, we miss you, but you're with us here in spirit. And like my husband, Jason, as Harry said, I know you can't be here tonight, honey, but I love you, and I'll see you later. So CSUN as an incubator. For example, eight years ago, uh, here at CSUN, while working with Susan Mazrui, M-A-Z-U-R-I, Aaron Bangor, B-A-N-G-O-R, and Mark Balsano, B-A-L-S-A-N-O. We met with Microsoft, IBM, Apple, Comcast to explore the idea of an office on accessible technology. And AT&T became the first to do that, and today it's an emerging industry standard. Last year here at CSUN, uh, and also at M Enabling, thanks to the WITH Foundation, we recorded interviews with accessible technology leaders, which was actually Harry's idea, so that we could archive leadership that was created here at CSUN as the nation ramps up to the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I hope you all join us on July 23rd at the Kennedy Center for ADA 30 Lead On Celebration of Disability Arts culture, and pride with the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. So this being of service does drive my life work. So for example, when Mike, Larry, and Margot wanted to create more authentic stock photos, our focus groups with authentic leaders of the National Disability Leadership Alliance resulted in the disability collection and guidelines for 240,000 photographers who shoot worldwide for Getty Images. And focus groups with Bank of America launched the Accessible Banking Division, and AT&T tested their advertising marketing messages and created a rate plan for deaf folks. And Apple, but can't talk about that. 
So when Mattel launched Becky, Barbie's friend who used a wheelchair, um, we positioned that with the reauthorization of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And then when she didn't fit in the inaccessible dream house, there was crisis communications. But Ron Mace fixed that, and now the dream house is accessible. And as Harry mentioned, our Lights Camera Access Project builds on the success of the Media Access Office for aspiring filmmakers, storytellers, and media professionals with disabilities to own the narrative because disability media has the power to shatter myths on large, small, and personal screens worldwide. We have 136 collaborators, but I want to just shout out a few of them because it's really a team and a community that builds this project. Derek Shields from the National Disability Mentoring Coalition, Steve Allen from PolicyWorks, Michael Koffer, K-A-U-F-E-R, from Deaf Film Camp, Dominic Evans, D-O-M-I-N-I-C-K, from Dis Film, Anna Packman, J.D. Michaels, the California Department of Rehabilitation, Television Academy, NBC Universal, Emma McElroy, who's also a CSUN alum, Jilsa Fernandez, San Diego State, the Coelho Center, Facebook, and on. It's really a community of people that want to change the way that disability is shown in the media. So in closing, as our new world moves to more virtual gatherings, it's the groundbreaking work at CSUN that allows millions of students around the world as universities shift from physical classrooms to virtual platforms, you here at CSUN in this wonderful incubator that Harry started are making those platforms more accessible so everybody cannot be left behind. So this award is deeply personal. You know, it's dis diversity is a business imperative and inclusion's a choice. And all of you here at CSUN and all of you at home that are usually here at CSUN, you, let's, um, you have a relentless pursuit of accessible and usable technology towards inclusion. So when we all wash our hands over and over and over again, let's sing happy birthday twice to CSUN, to Harry who built the dream, and to Sandy and her team who carry the torch. And in the immortal words of Justin Dart, I love you, lead on, lead on. You have the power to live the dream. Thank you. So congratulations, Terry, and thank you so much, Harry, for the tremendous remarks in introducing her. We have one other award that we're going to present this evening. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Klaus Mike Meisenberger, Program Chair for the Science Research Track and Journal Editor, uh, to present the Arthur I. Kirschmer Award for Assistive Technology Research. Why don't you come forward, Klaus? Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to be here. It's not a big crowd, and I have to say I'm dangerous these days. Uh, three weeks ago, I had a PhD defense, a very nice rehabilitation tool, arm rehabilitation. And guess where it was? It was in Milan, in Italy. <laughs> and so the region is closed down. And then I left for season last week, and I came here. And yesterday, I got the message my university is closed down. I don't know what will happen here when I go back home, but I hope that everything will go on as usual. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my big honor to introduce the award for assistive technology research in memory of our dear friend and outstanding colleague, Dr. Arthur Kashmer, who was a pioneer in the field of assistive technology and a researcher in the field of accessibility, in particular in math and science. Together with Art, I had the privilege and the honor 
to be part of the advisory council of this wonderful conference. And we started to work on setting up this journal. And the reason was Harry Murphy, Dr. Harry Murphy started the conference embedded into a research and science setting. And the tremendous of, uh, success over the years Fortunately, it led to a situation that more and more industry got involved, politics got involved, education got involved. It was application-oriented. And we got the feeling science and research is a bit stepping out of the game. But we need all stakeholders in the value chain, and therefore we started this journal. And we are happy we are step-by-step step growing, in particular, in quality and the aim of the journal is and the aim of this prize is to motivate more researchers to stand up to submit and to present the research the wonderful research for the quality of life for people with disabilities is presented at this conference the scientific track accepts a few papers we are very selective this prize honors the best of the best. This year's 2020, the third Dr. Arthur Kashma Award for Assistive Technology Research goes to the paper, Use of M-Health Technologies by People with Vision Impairment. Research performed and pushed forward at the Smith Catherwell Eye Research Institute and the authors and winners of the award are James M. Cochlin, Yuang Shen, and Brandon Biggs. And I do hope that one of the three authors is with us. Awesome, thank you. This is a huge honor for us, and, um, uh, and it was a big surprise. Um, so we're gonna be presenting all our research on Thursday at 9 a.m., uh, so come to, our come to my presentation. Um, so uh, I want to thank all the people and organizations who helped us get to this point with CAM.io, which is our um, the application that we, we did research on. So first, I'd like to thank Joshua Miele, who had the original idea for our project. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, the other members of our team, James, who's written all the, the grants and, and, um, and took a lead on this project. Uh, Huing, who's done all the software um, development from the early days of using a connect to our latest iOS uh, app. And, um, I'd also like to thank our uh, user testers and participants who uh, got to deal with all the, the buggy apps and horrible user experiences uh, to get where we are now. Um, and uh, I'd also like to thank the National Eye Institute, uh, the National Institute on uh, uh, in Disabilities, Independent Living and Research, and the smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute for all the support that uh, you, you guys have provided to us. Thank you so much. This is amazing, and, and um, I hope to see you all on Thursday. Congratulations. Thank you. How about another cheer for our two award recipients? Thank you, Klaus. So now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Rory Cooper, this year's keynote speaker. Dr. Cooper holds several prestigious positions, including Associate Dean for Inclusion and FISA and Paralyzed Veterans of America, Distinguished Professor of Rehabilitation Science and Technology and Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, He's also the founding director and the Veterans Administration Senior Research Career Scientist at the Human Engineering Research Laboratories. He holds an adjunct professorship at the Robotics Institute, 
Carnegie Mellon University and is also a professor of physical medicine and re rehabilitation at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. A prolific writer, he has published over 300 peer-reviewed articles and three books, including the award-winning Care of the Combat Amputee. He has over 25 patents awarded or pending. Dr. Cooper's students have been the recipients of over 50 national and international awards. A fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and other scholarly organizations, he is a recipient of the Secretary of Defense's Meritorious Civilian Service Medal. In May of this year, he was honored in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian Institute Museum, Museum of American History with a U.S. patent and trademark, Office Inventor Trading Card and Portrait. Dr. Cooper's contributions are impressive and numerous, and if I had to tell you about all of them, we wouldn't hear his keynote address. So please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Cooper. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sandy and Harry, for extending the invitation for me to speak with you this evening. Um, I'm not a CSUN graduate, but I'm a Cal State University. I'm a Cal Poly San Luis Obispo graduate. And believe it or not, I was born just a few miles from here in Alhambra. California, so it's good to be home again. Um, and I still have family in the area, which is also nice as well to be able to, uh, unfortunately, they, they're all sick, so they didn't come this evening, but uh, uh, hopefully I'll get to see them before I leave. So um, as, you, I, as you can see, let me see if we can, let me get started here. I think we have a problem because it went to sleep on us, or? Which I can't see the keyboard. Well, hopefully they everything to go smoothly now. Believe it or not, we did rehearse this this afternoon. By the way, this is Sean Shaw. He's a hard technology. Yeah. Well. Um, let's go. Did it switch on? Oh. Yeah, so I switch right there. Slide it that way. There we go. Okay. All right. Oh, wait a second. Not quite. <laughs> this could be the world's shortest keynote. <laughs> That's okay. Last year I gave a talk and there was a fire alarm in the middle of my uh, presentation. And the, the conference room, thanks. The, the, uh, the ballroom happened to be like on the fifth floor, so we all had to leave the building and come back. So that was a little bit disruptive. So if you ever get the chance to come to Pittsburgh, uh, you're welcome to come and visit us. This is... Um, this is where we're housed, which is an old Nabisco cookie factory that uh, is now a research park 
uh, with Philips America Research, uh, Google's East Coast headquarters, uh, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, and um, our human engineering research laboratories. So it's a pretty exciting place to be. Uh, for those of you that are students, um, it has some very unique features that come with being associated with places like Philips and Google, like a hotel, a toy store, a uh, massage, um, and uh, several restaurants, and a bar, all the things that you probably have available to you at CSUN as well. But uh, those are, so it does give you a little bit of ex experience of what the, uh, uh, the corporate world looks like, especially if you're in the high tech fields. Um, we happen to have the fourth floor on the far end of this building and the entire basement. And you'll see in a few minutes uh, why we have the basement. Um, I'm an engineer by training, uh, undergraduate in electrical engineering and a PhD in biomedical engineering. And so that's my area of interest is in technology for people with disabilities. Um, that comes about uh, two things I want to show. This picture up here is the um, cover of the IEEE magazine Spectrum. IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. It's the largest engineering society in the world with over 300,000 members. And um, you know, as you heard, we, we, you know, we're trying to get into the media and mainstream and the sports, but very few people know about any famous engineers, which hopefully we're changing that with the uh, trading card series that's come out with the US Patent and Trademark Office to know about inventors, innovators, and engineers. Also, um, I thought that uh, if, you know, if you're from the East, you should know about Howard Rusk. You should know about him from California. The Rusk Institute for Rehabilitation in New York uh, was also an officer in World War II in charge of the um, rehabilitation programs. Uh, and he was a friend of uh, President Roosevelt's. And he was one of the early proponents of uh, allowing soldiers to return to service after they were severely wounded, which also um, if you know, I'm not from the Vogue Rehab world, but I played in the Vogue Rehab world. Uh, it was part of my department for a number of years that there's this kind of a back and forth between laws for veterans, then the laws for civilians, and laws for veterans, laws for civilians. And so he was very instrumental in changing both, in both perspectives. I throw that out there because it's very pertinent today you know, unemployment's still pretty high, uh, and technology and opportunity, I think, can make big changes in those areas. I also think we need to reach out to younger people, uh, not just younger people with disabilities, but all younger people. This is a whiz pop bang. It's a magazine for middle schoolers in, out of the UK. It also has a website and has a, and um, social media, and they have over a million subscribers, which is pretty huge by today's standards. And one of the things I enjoy about it, one of the opportunities I think you should take advantage of whenever you have at every opportunity is to be involved in mainstream activities and to encourage students with and without disabilities to work together and get involved. This happened to be their issue on wheels. So really had nothing to do with wheelchairs or wheeled mobility. It was just about teaching kids about wheels. But they feature a prominent scientist from somewhere in the world with every issue on whatever that topic is. And they asked me if I would be willing to accept that honor and, and, and be featured in their magazine. Um, because I use wheels, uh, develop things with wheels, and um, I'm very interested in encouraging uh, more kids with disabilities to participate in STEM, hopefully alongside kids without disabilities in an, in an equal and fair manner so that we have uh, generations of scientists and engineers and mathematicians in the future that have been trained together and can change our future for us. I tell people frequently, and I really mean this, is kind of like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. 
I get to play with robots and all these technologies. Our ambition is to apply engineering and advanced technology to improve the mobility and function of individuals with disabilities. A large number of them are our veteran population. Hey. Every day that you come in, there's this kind of wonderful energy here. From students to staff to faculty, we wouldn't really be living up to our, our mission if we didn't include people with disabilities in all aspects of what we do. Our vision is a world where everyone with a disability can participate on a level playing field to their greatest extent possible. I've got a disability, you know. I certainly wouldn't think of myself as disabled, but it was having a huge impact on my life, on my wife and my children. We can do better than that. We, we have to do better than that. So I work here because I want to give everyone an equal opportunity to whatever they want. Disability shouldn't be the thing that prevents them from getting those things. So that was actually a video that Google put together. Matt was a Google scholar. Matt has an incomplete spinal cord injury to a helicopter accident or helicopter crash while serving in the Army. Uh, he also happens to have uh, three children uh, with, uh, they're on the autism spectrum as well. And so he's a, he's a great member of our team who after leaving the service, uh, came in and did an internship program with us and then stayed and got an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering was a, under a Google scholarship. So I um, also hope you showed that well, uh, in there you can see that we have a lot of engineers and scientists with disabilities working in our labs. Uh, they are part of our team. Um, they are you know, paid living wages as scientists and engineers and that's also very critical as well um, and do very successfully. I also think, as you know, um, the assistive technology is an important for making it possible for me to be here, right? So I can drive, use my wheelchair, have an accessible hotel room. Um, my wife actually is here with us today. She's pictured in the yellow jacket there. Uh, just to test your um, unconscious bias, the, <laughs> the gentleman in the blue jacket is Dr. Jung Bae Kim. He is not Rosie's client in that picture. He's Rosie's colleague in that clip picture. And he is now the chairman of the Department of Occupational Therapy at Yonsei University in Korea. So he was one of my students several years ago. And a large number of the providers there are people with disabilities or family members of people with disabilities. And it's important, as you all know, that you have engineers and scientists and clinicians and people with disabilities all working together, including their families, because it's really a team effort that makes progress. I also want to throw a little plug in for the World Health Organization and the USAID, who is trying to uh, change things globally. And there's a great program you can sign up for free called the World Health Organization's GATE Conference. Uh, our GATE committee and GATE is uh, the Global Assistive Health Technology uh, Committee. So I am a strong promoter, proponent of this concept or participatory action design and engineering or paid or participatory action engineering, kind of depends on where you go, where that we, you need uh, individuals with disabilities and family members to be engaged in the process uh, throughout the entire process, from conceptualization all the way into uh, community participation and setting clinical practice guidelines if you're working on devices that are covered by medical insurance, for example, and in setting policy otherwise, and through the FDA. And it's important that we infuse uh, individuals' disabilities uh, through all aspects of this process. And I don't mean by using them as only as study participants, but I mean as designers and engineers and people that conceptualize the challenges, but also as policy makers and people that work in insurance. So I actually have one of my students from a long time ago who had a fairly involved cerebral palsy and used a power wheelchair who um, studied computer science and now is an executive at Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. So he gets to set healthcare um, policy. 
Um, one good thing um, I will tell you, especially young people, when you get invited to serve on national committees, say yes. Um, you can, there's, I've been able to serve on uh, several um, national academy committees as well as other committees that have resulted in policy papers. And one of the things that we've been able to demonstrate for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services as well as for the VA um, and Health and Human Services. And if you're looking, if you're following right now, um, Congress is requesting a report from the National Academies on airline travel, which uh, Tammy Duckworth, who herself has multiple uh, amputations due to, her, uh, to a helicopter crash in Iraq, uh, now a senator from Illinois, uh, has, uh, has commissioned. And so that way you can help change not only policy, but industry direction and scientific directions as well. Um, one of the things that happens as you get older in academia, if you're successful, you can maybe um, branch out from maybe your traditional areas of research or, and teaching. And one of the things that become of interest to me, probably because I graduated from the California State University system, is in access to education. And um, so I got engaged in conducting research on barriers to STEM education for individuals with disabilities. And what's amazing, in this July, the ADA will turn 30 years of age. I had a disability before there was the Americans with Disabilities Act. And if you want to hear horror stories, I've got plenty of them. I probably, the only way I would have been able to come to this conference probably back prior to the ADA was either to beg somebody to pretend they're my attendant or to drive from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to California, just so you know. Unfortunately, that's still a problem if you have um, very severe disabilities that require, for example, a power chair and a respirator, you're likely to take a lot of long drives if you want to have a career in academia. And um, I meet that challenge with my students all the time. I also, what I find shocking is with the 30th year of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and most students in STEM, science, technology, and mathematics, are note takers and observers, not active participants in their classes. And that we find that somewhat acceptable for some reason. And we need to change that. And we have the technology, we actually have the know-how, and of course we can develop more of that in order to make it inclusive. But we're not going to change this world unless young people, let's say young people defined as anybody under 30, given the 60s slogan, never trust anybody over 30, <laughs> um, that uh, to actually change the world is that they need to have opportunities and to fully participate in STEM education is one of those opportunities that should be a right in the United States. Um, I'm a veteran, if you didn't know that. Uh, I was injured while serving in the Army uh, a long time ago. And um, one of the things that I felt, well, I felt obligated to do was after 9-11 to make sure that veterans returning home were treated better than veterans of previous generations, especially the Vietnam era veterans. And so we've been lucky that um, the military has embraced that and the VA has embraced that by and large. And, uh, but still, the transition from rehabilitation into community participation and education is, a, is still a tremendous barrier and something that we all need to work on. And uh, I think one of the great organizations that's leading that way, by the way, is the Student Veterans of America. I know Cal State University Northwards, our CSUN, has an active uh, Student Veterans of America chapter. So I encourage you to get engaged with them so that you can engage with the students who are um, the veterans that are on campus and have disabilities as well. Uh, instead of segregating the two populations, we should integrate both populations. So let me start to tell you a little bit about some of my current research. I mentioned the participatory action design and engineering. 
So this is uh, the sort of a summary of one of the papers that we published uh, a couple years ago. We have a couple more in press that should be coming out this year. Uh, this was a survey of, at the time of uh, over, a little over 1,000 people. We wound up with a little over 1,600 people with disabilities from across the United States. This is just gives you a breakdown of some of those diagnoses. We were looking at this case about individuals with mobility impairments and um, trying to create a roadmap. Turns out that Congress and the Surgeon General and several others over the last 10 years have published several reports saying we need a roadmap for um, mobility research. And so nobody had actually taken on that challenge. We thought we would start to at least initiate the discussion and start with some research in that area. So uh, it's very interesting that we came up with five different domains. One of them was dominant and probably applies to um, almost all areas of research engaging people with disabilities, and that's the concept of participatory action design and research with the components of universal design policy practice, as well as cost, education, research, um, standards and reliability, and then dissemination and knowledge translation. That was the highest priority among all of them. If you're looking specifically in mobility research, advanced wheelchair design, smart device applications, human machine interfaces, and assistive robotics, and intelligent systems, which in some ways the assistive robotics and intelligent systems, human machine interfaces and smart device applications, I would argue are probably fairly universal, right? So most of us carry this smart computer with us around everywhere we go, and it has a lot of power to be inclusive. It also has a lot of power to discriminate as well. I'm sure some of you heard the, about you know, AI, and AI is a priority for NIH research and NSF research and DOD research, but AI is a double-edged sword, right? If done well, it can be a tool for inclusion. If done poorly, it can be a tool for discrimination. And so we need to be engaged in that discussion, so it's a tool for inclusion. So I actually started some of my early research here in California with using wheelchair standards. So believe it or not, well, I'm sure that some of it's easy to believe, when I was first injured, you could prescribe a wheelchair from across the room. There was really just one manufacturer of wheelchair, that was Everston Jennings. They had about 98% of the worldwide market and they made three different sizes, 16, 18, inch, and 20 inch, and they came in blue, brown, green, and red nog hide. They weighed about 80 pounds, and the frames were chrome plated. Now, you can see I'm a really big guy, and so that chair weighed just about the same weight I did, maybe a little bit less. So I can you imagine trying to haul that into a car? At the same time, the car industry had decided that they were going to go away from two-door cars to four-door cars. So the old two-door cars, the door used to up wide enough that you could haul in something that weighed half the size of the car. <laughs> now when they went to four-door cars, you just could stare at the car and try to figure out, so how am I supposed to take this with me? Of course, that led to why vans became very popular because it was about the only way you could haul those things around. But that led some of us to start designing better wheelchairs. Better wheelchairs also meant looking at the quality of wheelchairs. Now you can imagine that Everston Jennings in the 1970s and 1980s thought the wheelchair was perfect. And why do you think they thought it was perfect? Because they've been selling the same model since 1932. And they had 98% of the marketing. So by definition, that's perfect. Of course, when people like me and Marilyn Hamilton and Bobby Hall and others came around, we decided that really was a Jeff Meaning Breaker from Southern California. 
that that really had not been, and it needed a little more attention. So other thing is, if you want to make things improved, as our dean of students will tell you, you have to measure them. If you measure things, then they become important. So we had to develop standards, and then we had to measure them. I took a little heat from this. I also had a, a Mary Berger was our vice president up in Sac State at the time, and she was willing to take a little heat with me because we started the first independent test laboratory. If we've actually started the first test laboratory in the United States because the wheelchair manufacturers didn't want to test. Because if you don't know, what, what you don't know won't hurt you, right? And so uh, we created one at Cal State University of Sacramento and we started tasting the wheelchairs and we just found out that they broke. And if you know anything about Meyer Kaplan survival curve analysis, that's what these graphs are here, that that line is the standard that all wheelchairs should pass. And if you look, there's a lot of wheelchairs on the left side of that line. And those wheelchairs are FDA approved and on the market. Which also goes to why you need to make sure that F regulators also um, actually do their job. And uh, FDA does not have a test laboratory for wheelchairs or other assistive devices, by the way. Uh, we do in the VA, and, every, and the federal government essentially relies heavily on us. The other thing I found very interesting is, even though I'm just a lowly electrical and biomedical engineer, there are a lot of very common mechanical engineering mistakes, like heat affected stress, high stress areas and heat affected zones and, and holes in, heat effect, in, in high stress areas. Things that even I learned at Cal Poly in my sophomore year. So um, they're not hard things to solve. So then a hobby of mine is wheelchair racing and I was, had the good fortune of um, qualifying and participating in the 1988 uh, Paralympic Games in Seoul, Korea. And actually, um, this is why you want to stay involved in science. I get to go to Tokyo this year as chair of the Paralympic Sports Technology Committee, which um, <laughs> And those of you know that about adapt anything about adaptive sports, there's literally millions and billions of dollars in adaptive sports and adaptive sports research. No, there's like a dollar and a half. I probably have more in my wallet than there is in those, in those sports, but uh, um, it's at least, oh, maybe we'll get that point, we'll get to that point at some point. But um, I discovered this interesting problem. I was uh, um, asked to lead training programs at Cal State University of Sacramento, and um, I noticed that the wheelchair racers didn't really have a higher incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome or rotator cuff injuries than people that just push their everyday chairs. And in fact, many of them had fewer incidents. And so I wondered why. Um, so it turns out that while I was a grad student, at UC Santa Barbara, training for the Paralympics, I was working on developing this racing chair smart wheel. This is the current version of it. Um, I had purely altruistic motives. I wanted to go faster than everybody else, and I was an engineer, so I thought I would develop a device that could measure how efficient I was at propelling my wheelchair, and I could optimize my racing wheelchair, and then I could be faster than other people. As my wife will say, I'm a better engineer than I am an athlete, and so I have to rely on technological doping in order to be competitive. <laughs> and so um, that technology, though, I realized, allowed us to study the biomechanics of wheelchair propulsion, and so we translated it into an everyday smart wheel, which is also kind of funny, because I did that as a grad student in 1989. In 1991, the magazine PN Magazine, I mean, in a 2001, PN Magazine named it as the new product of the year. 
which now you know how country and western singers that have been singing in honky tonks for 20 years become the new, the outstanding young artist of the year, right? And they go up on stage going, all right, you know. Um, I've been in a lot of smoky bars, but finally I'm a great new artist. So, um, but that turned out to be a great tool for understanding why racers and other people didn't develop rotator cuff injuries or I think I have to, or carpal tunnel syndrome. That green circle represents the median nerve and this up above represents the, that's the biceps tendon. Those are the common injuries that people occurred. And um, so what we've learned is if you got a lighter wheelchair and you move the axle a bit further forward, you'd, um, you could reduce your risk of injury pretty significantly. Uh, what was, and what that led us to was maybe we could develop better push rims. Because if you're familiar with push rims and probably in the exhibit hall, you see just a small little 7 8 inch diameter round tubes, which cause you to use a pinch grip rather than a tool grip, which puts a lot of pressure on the upper extremities. And oops, so we developed two ergonomic push rims, the natural fit and the, oops, Sorry. The natural fit and the surge. If you want to take a look, I'm using the surge myself. Um, what's really exciting is something that happened in 80% of manual wheelchair users after five years now happens in about 20%. And most of the people have reported that having the, the, that carpal tunnel syndrome or rotator cuff injuries was like having, getting a new injury but even more severe. And so it's also saved the health system um, millions of dollars of surgeries that aren't, weren't necessary. It also led to a clinical practice guideline. As I mentioned, just to show you a couple of quick things here I want to talk. When we talked about the wheelchairs breaking, one of the things we discovered is a lot of the shocks come through the front casters. So um, if I used to race motorcycles as a kid, and one of the things that became popular was the monoshock designed rear suspension on motorcycles. And by looking at how the forces were applied to the push or to the front casters of wheelchairs, we um, came up with sort of a monoshock design for the front casters, which greatly reduces the injuries. Um, also makes the chair last longer because you're not a, a initial in the shocks. Another thing I mentioned, the racing wheelchairs, we have a device on racing wheelchairs we call a crown compensator. So all roads are sort of sloped in a crown, so if you're not right on the middle line, you go to the left or the right. I actually developed a crown compensator in the mid, early 1980s because I realized that when I got in a race, everybody lined up on the white line down the middle of the road and nobody wanted to pass because it would take more work on one arm or the other arm. So I developed a crown compensator so I could get onto the side, of the, the right or the left, and uh, they couldn't really follow me. So if I could get out in front and get to the right or the left, they'd all have to work harder than I would. Um, later on, we decided, thought, hey, I could apply a similar concept to everyday chairs, and that's what we call the path lock. That's the, image on the left, but it's activated by flipping the lever down and either mechanically or magnetically biasing the caster to go straight. Now I'll tell you what's very interesting about this is I thought, hey, this could be a great way to have a, uh, make an ultralight wheelchair a one-arm drive. So if you had a stroke or if you only had one arm or you had an impaired arm, you could take a nice wheelchair and make it into a one-arm drive. When it went commercial, that's not what people bought it for. You know what people bought it for? They wanted to get their coffee cup from their kitchen to their dining room. <laughs> <laughs> right? And not have to set the hot coffee cup between their legs. And so they would clip it down and they could push straight and then they could, um, they could kind of tug on it and turn, or they could flip it up and turn. So 
uh, it's also very curious just to see when things get out in the real world how people um, use them. So another challenge is, is that, um, that but most people with this the wheelchair users uh, are obese. Um, and so it's very difficult to get exercise from your wheelchair. And um, if you continue to eat as you did before, especially if you have a traumatic injury or you acquire a disease, then you're likely to gain weight. And I showed you with the carpal tunnel syndrome slide, the other thing that's cre there is also related to weight. So if you keep your weight down, you're less likely to develop carpal tunnel syndrome or cuff injuries, but you're also, if you stay alive long enough, less likely to develop a heart attack or have a heart attack or develop a stroke. Um, so we've been working on apps, we call it Wheel Fit. It's using metabolic or indirect calorimetry to measure um, how much um, energy expenditure various activities are and try to promote people to participate in exercise. Now, you can imagine how hard it is to change people. So how many people have done every sort of psychometric research? Or, okay, so I've talked to the wrong crowd here. <laughs> so how many of you have ever participated in a survey? How many of you completed that survey a few minutes before the person wanting it asked for you to turn it in? Okay, so that's a natural tendency. So if you look at this graph here, the light blue is sleeping, the darker blue is sedentary activity, and the yellow is very light exercise, right? or very light activity, not exercise. The red is exercise, okay? Now they've got this app that tells them when and how to exercise, right? And they can sort of pick their times. So, so if you know a little bit about research, of conducted research, See that little red there? There's a lot of red in this at this time frame. You know what happened at that time frame? That's when the graduate student went to visit them. <laughs> right? So what did everybody do? They exercised right before the graduate student went to visit them just to say, yes, of course I'm at, I exercise. I'm doing it diligently, just like you asked. What I find fascinating is they know we're monitoring them. I can literally pick up my own phone and see if they're exercising or not. So um, is, that's why you see lots of ads for Jenny Craig, because it's not easy, right? So what do all weight loss programs have in common? Weighing yourself, right? They all tell you to weigh yourself. So, you know how often I can get myself weighed? About once per year when I go in for my annual physical, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's a hard weight loss management program, right? If you get weighed once a year or maybe twice a lifetime, that's uh, not easy to kind of manage your weight. So we thought about that. So where do most people go every day? To bed, right? And so we decided that we would do is put scales underneath the feet of the, I like this picture because this is from our lab. We manufactured this large number of units ourselves and uh, we have, can do, do both the electronics and the hardware, and I think they look pretty good, don't you? And it, we try to make things look commercial quality because if you do research and things look like they're put together with duct tape and bailing wire and chewing gum, most of us try to look at our head and go, I don't know, you want me to give up my wheelchair and use that for the next month? You know, I'm not, I might not survive the study. And so um, we try to make things work and look as professional as possible before we ask other people, because we realize that it's a, everybody's time is valuable, 
and their knowledge is extremely valuable to us as well. And like I said earlier, we are them. So um, it basically just, it's very flat, and it sits under the posts of the four beds, and it talks to your phone, and it tells you how much you weigh, and we had to add some artificial intelligence. Might be easy to guess why. You may not be the only one sleeping in that bed. Or, and so we have to, so it's a way to determine what your partner's weight is as well, whether they want to tell you that or not. Um, and also your dog's weight. <laughs> um, and another part of it too is that interestingly enough, there's a lot of, as we found out, um, how many times, pe some people in the study use this to come back and say, you know what, my um, attendant or personal assistant really doesn't turn me as much at night as I like them to, or they need to, and they can record that as well. So, um, we hopefully we've got a commercial partner, hopefully this will be available sometime next year. So the, the virtual seating coach was developed uh, basically in order to meet the clinical need that we had identified of people getting power wheelchairs with power seat functions, but their uh, condition uh, not, not improving. And so uh, we did a series of experiments to identify that people would use their power seat functions, but not necessarily as instructed. The idea with the virtual seating coach was to use the advances in technology, uh, the first onboard computing, uh, later with a, a smartphone technology, to uh, provide that coaching in real time, contextually aware, uh, all the time available to the user, and to provide that data to the cloud, one, so those algorithms could be improved uh, based on what was learned, as well as share that data with clinicians in order to improve their clinical practice and eventually improve uh, clinical practice guidelines. And ultimately the goal is that we use the technology interacting with the user to uh, help the user get the maximum benefit from the technology they're using. So you can see the virtual CD coach tells helps remind the person's contextually aware, so if you're driving down the road, it won't bother you. If you did a pressure relief five minutes ago, it won't bother you. It tells you how much to tilt, what order to tilt and recline, and then it uh, tells you how long. Um, it, interesting is it, it's, um, it's a, we licensed it to Permobile, if you would want to talk about how veterans help, can help the civilian sector in a funny way, is the VA has very stringent IT regulations information technology regulations. So even though the VA helped support the development of the product and the research to support it, they couldn't, they couldn't provide it after it was commercially available. So Permobile makes it available for free. It's free on all Permobile power wheelchairs. So it's just something you have to ask your manufacturer's rep or supplier if you have a Permobile power wheelchair. Hopefully it become available on other chairs at some time in the future. Um, it reduced, in the initial study, reduced people by about fourfold. But we had introduced some gaming theory, and gaming theory is pretty simple. It basically, we added a little thermometer, and if you were compliant, your thermometer was green, and if you're not compliant, it went more red. Um, most people chose the flowering plant, the flowering tree, so if you got leaves, if you're more compliant, if you're really compliant, you got flowers. And if you're less compliant, the flowers died and then the leaves died. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised. If you ever watched The Big Bang Theory and Sheldon Cooper, how he was able to keep his digital pet alive for 20 some years. I mean, that's, uh, people really wanted to keep that tree flowering. And that increased it by another four fold, which could save people pressure ulcers um, as well as save the healthcare system. It was pretty successful, so we actually started working on a manual wheelchair version. The manual wheelchair version's a bit trickier because 
we are, don't have to just guide people on how to use their um, power seat functions and instruct them. So it's all about instruction, by the way. So we don't want to become a virtual nag, we want to be a virtual coach. And what coaches do is good coaches instruct people on how to do things and instruct the things that they really want to do. So um, we did is we designed these sensors on the screen here and uh, they go up underneath the seat of the wheelchair and so you don't really know they're there and it talks to your um, phone and then um, has apps to show you how to do various pressure reliefs and then how long and your clinician can work with you to say how long you need to do a pressure relief and what different types of pressure relief so like leaning forward is one of them also if you're what's called an active sitter like I am where you kind of wiggle around and scoot around and move around it doesn't bother you it leaves you alone but if you wind up sitting still for a long time then it comes in and kicks on to remind you. So we're actually in trials for that now. Unfortunately, you have to live in the Pittsburgh area if you want to participate in those trials. Oops. Some people are not going to move um, or are unable to move. Some people are not going to move no matter what you tell them to do, and some people are unable to move. So we've been we're working with Utari. My guess is you don't know what Utari is. Utari is the University of Texas Applied Research Institute. I wish we had a similar thing in California or in Pennsylvania, and that's where the state invests in developing applied research. Part of that is assistive technology research. A friend of mine is the director there, so we've partnered on some studies together, and we've been working on an active cushion. Uh, believe it or not, that's a simulated butt that we created actually for helicopter seat research. If you've ever flown in a helicopter, they, they do a lot of vibration through your seat. And uh, we had a fully instrumented butt. And we worked on this cushion that uh, basically um, has a, a series of pumps. It can add and remove air to each one of those cells individually. And what we do then is, and if you, this is the, uh, that's the pressure from the cells. That's the pressure from a pressure mapping system. If you know anything about pressure mapping systems, they're sort of notoriously, notoriously inaccurate, um, but there's good correlation between the two. This is if you just inflate it, you have a person sit on it, just like you normally would like a passive cushion. You just sort of do the, like a rojo, per se. Um, and then we run an offload algorithm. You can see it, it offloads the ischial tuberosities like you would expect. And then we actually created an algorithm to minimize the pressure over all of the seated area and does a much better job and you get rid of um, uh, any red spots like you would see here in a normal cushion. My name is Joshua Zhong. I am a researcher at the Human Engineering Research Labs. My research project is focused on the performance evaluation and the user interface of the assistive robotic manipulators. So the assistive robotic arms is that a robotic arm can be mounted on the wheelchairs and uh, that can assist uh, uh, wheelchair users or people with the disability to do uh, some daily tasks uh, using the control interface. So, so the reason we developed the interface is that uh, we have tests with the uh, current uh, robotic original interfaces and uh, a lot of users have difficulty learning those uh, either take some memorize the keys or memorize the command or combination of uh, different keystrokes. So the interface we de developed kind of a 
reduce those uh, frustration so they can quickly learn how to use, control the robot and they can do the task just uh, within 10 minutes. There was one veteran looked at our robot and he's so, so he was so excited and he, he said, he just point to the robot and, and saying to the, the caregiver, that's what I want. So I, I think the robot would be really helpful for people sitting in a chair and still want to achieve something for their lives. So how many people in this room are occupational therapists? Oh, not so many. All right. So we um, did this study in conduction in, in uh, cooperation with some occupational therapy faculty members. And one of the things that the robot's not all that dexterous. So we developed tools for the robot with 3D printing. What we found very interesting was that the OTs pretty much uniformly took our tools. It's because they had clients they could apply them to that didn't necessarily have access to the robot. The other thing is we're trying to figure out, we're trying to, go back, um, trying to test the robot and interfaces and also new end effectors or what you might call grippers or hands by having people make pancakes. Do you believe even if you buy pre-mixed pancake batter, there's over 100 steps to make pancakes? You also believe that robots can make pancakes? But also, they're not very good. People don't want to eat them. <laughs> so we learned you have to not only be able to make pancakes, you have to be able to make pancakes that people want to eat. So you probably heard about 3D printing, or more commonly additive manufacturing. We're very lucky to have several very good industrial quality machines in our center. Um, and these are some pictures of them. Let me show you just a few examples. This is Alec. Alec um, would like to use one of the robotic arms. Alec, though, cannot use the interface that we originally developed. And of course, like most consumers, including myself, Alec wanted to embed his cell phone into the, to the controller of the device. That way he'd have his cell phone handy and he could control it very easily. So, and then he was actually said he'd prefer to use the zero throw joystick, which is something we invented a long time ago, actually at Sac State, um, with his, uh, to operate his phone as well. And so Alec was able to um, use the robot independently in the trial. We have another individual now trying to get this, he's the first person trying to get our insurance plan to cover it. We have a second person now trying to do that as well. They are covered by the VA, by the way, if you need to use that as leverage. Hey, good evening, DAV. Dan Clare, I'm here at the National Disabled Veterans Winter Sports Clinic, a great, great event that we do with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and, and I'm here in a room. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna stop the video just, so um, this is the, in the background, is the past president of the Disabled American Veterans who happens to have all four limbs amputated. He was a rescue diver, saved somebody's life off the coast of Alaska, wound up getting frostbite in all four limbs and had his, uh, both his legs and arms amputated. Just to give you an idea what sacrifices some of our service members are willing to make. Um, so he went, turns out, he went on to get a degree in computer science and he used like a, I'm sure you have it in the exhibit hall, like a $5,000 ped pointing piece of equipment. And he said, you know what? I'd really rather just use a mouse again. <laughs> and so um, he used his prosthetic hooks rather effectively. And so we developed and patented um, a prosthetic computer mouse that he could use. Um, and also, that's, we've had a left-handed, right-handed size, and there's different sizes of, of prosthetic hooks as well. So we commented all those. Very simple with 3D printing, um, and it's about a $40 solution. Um, the funny thing is, 
is in this field if you know if you do it right. You know you know how you do it right? The participant keeps your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and not only does he keep your stuff, he took the other people's stuff as well. So he took the stuff that we had for him plus the other participants. So we had to make it for them. And also, I got a very funny call from him later saying, you know what? I put one of them in my office, I put the other one in my home, and now my wife doesn't have to switch the software over between the two, she just uses my mouse. <laughs> so another sort of interesting thing um, is because we're tied into the VA, and I worked as a VA provider at Walter Reed for a number of years, this is a patient-controlled anesthesia device. You've probably seen it in the movies if you ever, ever tried it. There's a little button you push that looks like the call button for a nurse and allows you to put your, uh, to give yourself a little bit of medication controlled by the doctor. Well, how do you do that if you wind up with burns on your hands and feet or you have all four limbs amputated? So a friend of mine, you know, former student of mine from the 1990s. So Dr. Walter Reed, he called me up and he goes, hey Rory, I got this problem, you need to fix it for me. And so, which by the way, if you're an engineer, I get those calls on a regular basis. Some of them have to do with fixing my grandmother's TV, other ones all the way to uh, helping out at Walter Reed. But uh, um, turns out the FDA won't let you modify it patient-controlled anesthesia device without going through FDA uh, clearance, and the manufacturer didn't want to do that. So he basically 3D printed a big easy button that fit right over the top of the switch, and then we taught the nurses to mount it to wherever the person could use it in their bed. And so it um, worked out pretty fun. We've been, and we just provide these um, to the soldiers uh, at Walter Reed and Brook Army Medical Center, and. San Diego and also the VA hospitals. Um, I also like the hand cycle, that's me. Um, and then, you know, we're looking at uh, customized handles as well so that you can better fit people's hands. All done with a combination of rapid prototyping. Even in the kitchen, where something as simple as preparing meals can be a real challenge. This kitchen is designed for people with Alzheimer's and brain injury. This is the queuing kitchen, where specially designed computer programs provide cues or step-by-step -step instructions for cooking things like pasta. When I click next, the program will give me my first instruction on, on how do I get started with making pasta. Take out cooking pot from the lighted cabinet. Take out pasta from the transparent cabinet. Fill the cooking pot with water from the water faucet. Turn the faucet off. Place cooking pot on the stove. Turn on the stove. This program is ideal for someone with cognitive or memory loss problems. But for those who need more help, there's this futuristic device called the Kitchen Bot. The Kitchen Bot can turn a faucet on and off. It can also open cabinets and drawers and operate appliances. It's so I go back. So this is our um, robotic assisted transfer device. So if you have to get transferred, if you have to have an assistant transfer off to like a couple of people, or you need a, a Hoyer lift, or which is more like an engine type lift, one of the things that we were asked to do is, can you use it so that it mounts to the wheelchair, because you use the weight of the wheelchair to help lift the, per, uh, be the stable base, makes it smaller to get in and out of a bathroom as well, and then um, easier to operate. So I'm gonna go back. You can turn the sound off for this one. So he's just holding a little joystick in his hand. That's 180 pound 
a rescue dummy that's being transferred. Um, as good engineers, we transfer rescue dummies before we transfer real people. And, and who's the first real person that has to be transferred? The engineer who designed the thing. It's a saying in engineering, eat your own dog food. <laughs> the nice thing about it is you can see you could be close to the person, it's stable, you don't need two people like you would with a Hoyer type lift, and it's actually faster. So those, for those individuals that want to get in and out of their bed, um, working on a device right now where the, you can do bed to wheelchair transfers without having to use any kind of lift or no lift or no assistance. Eventually, we'd like to be able to have people get in and out of bed by themselves. And it, I just got funding for one of my postdocs, is just, just received a grant who's going to be working on a version for the types of wheelchairs like the, the ladies in the audience are using. So, um, but you can see uh, Josh, who is the engineer in this project, and Jessica is actually also an engineer and a wheelchair user. She can't do these transfers independently. Normally she would have a assistant. And he's lifting the feet. There's Teflon coated on the, on the leg rest there, so she shouldn't have to. But most people prefer to have the heels just lifted up a little bit so you don't get sores on the heels. I think it's just, in some ways, the fact that it's ingrained into people so much through their training that they, uh, they do that. And then um, she can lift herself up and her head up and her feet up, so all of the different functions that you'd commonly want to have in a hospital-type bed. And she can get out of bed by reversing this process. And so um, I have to tell you a little story while you're watching this video. So uh, back to the, if it does well and you show it to other people, you're gonna lose it. So we brought one of these systems. The, it was a manual chair version at the time, which kind of grabbed the manual wheelchair and lifted it into the bed and, and tilted the person into bed. And we brought it to our VA long-term care facility in Pittsburgh. And there was a, a lady, Carol, there. She came up and she spoke with us quite extensively and wanted to be transferred in and out of bed. And then she left. And she came back about an hour later with her husband's physician and said to her, I want this. I want you to get it for my husband. So we rapidly made one for her husband. And she was able to take her husband home after being in the nursing home for three years. And after that happened, you know what else happened? She talked to the other ladies of the wives and the, uh, the other wives in the nursing home. And so we had to make a couple more. And at that point, we told the company we were working with, you need to accelerate bringing this to market um, because we can't continue to make these for one veteran at a time. But a lot of the feedback we got is we'd love to have a power wheelchair version. And then, of course, we got we started working on the power wheelchair version, and then we got a, we need to work on a power wheelchair with power seat functions version. I'm gonna skip this one, I think. I think I'll skip it. Oop, we can turn the sound off on this one, too. And I think I'll, I'll go back for you, just so you can catch this. Oop. Well, actually, I'll, I'll show you this video. This one doesn't need sound either. So this is Elaine. She's a grad student of mine. Uh, as you can see, Elaine um, had uh, congenital limb loss of all four limbs. And she, um, she really, she came to you as an undergraduate intern. She really wanted this, a personal mobility manipulation device. It's a robotic wheelchair with two robotic arms. So I told Elaine, come to graduate school and you can use the chair while you're in graduate school. So we're doing two experiments here. It's a lot of kind of fun. So one, we're testing as engineers how well it works. She's talking to it and using a tablet. 
We also work with faculty from the social science department who are observing the shoppers and the other staff and the staff in the uh, store. And we basically gave her some money and told her to buy whatever she wanted and then let us give us um, feedback. And then the, uh, the sociologists and the anthropologists were looking at the responses from other people because when you get technologies like this in the real world, you want to know how are people going to respond. We had permission from the store manager. So um, there is actually something unusual about this last transaction. Let me test your power of observation. What was unusual about her checking out as she checked out at the counter, the cash register? She handed him her wallet first. Then she handed the items to him. You know why that was? Because otherwise Elaine got free stuff. They would say, hey, oh, that is so cool. You don't have to pay. <laughs> and so we changed the study around a little bit so that she gave him the wallet first and then people would pay. All right, keep the sound off. So you remember Zhang Bei from the beginning? This is Zhang Bei now, um, probably 20 years later. He came back to visit from Korea. This is our MeBot, our Mobility Enhancement Robotic Wheelchair. That's uh, Heather and Jorge, two of the students working on the project. That's an eight inch curb he's climbing. So it detects the curb, identifies the height to climb it, and he keeps him stable the entire time. And I think if I push this, yeah. Um, and he can actually go up and down that curb by, and you notice, you can see a little hand function Zhang Bei has. He basically just has to push the toggle switch forward or backward. If he goes backwards, it'll go backwards. It'll reverse the, the sequence, but keep him stable the whole time. And you can see he went then down the eight inch curb. The other thing it has the advantage is he can talk at eye level. Um, and it could be a front wheel, mid wheel, or rear wheel drive chair based on, he, he can actually adjust that on the fly, literally while, while he's driving. So if he needs to, um, wants to be mid-wheel drive for tighter spaces, or front-wheel drive to climb it over a, a, an obstacle. The other thing it can do is it can actually self-level from side to side. So that original video I showed you from Google, there was a sequence in there, if you watch carefully, where Jessica rode with one wheel up and one wheel down as she rode across. And also what's very interesting is she actually rode across a pothole on one wheel and it moved up to keep her level. So um, we're actually working now to make this faster and smaller. And if I just want to call your attention to this picture on the right hand side, those are all three of my current or former students, um, all, all engineers. And Steve is an incomplete uh, individual with incomplete tetraplegia. So this is the current version. We've got rid of the pneumatic actuators. For those of you that aren't engineers in the audience, you probably don't care. But we're using electrohydraulic actuators, which if you watch on YouTube and Boston Dynamics, those are the same actuators used to like robots jump on tables. So those using power wheelchairs, who knows? Maybe you'll just jump onto this stage in the future. Just ride up, push the button, jump up on the stage. We'll see. Wouldn't that be more Hori and Siva's problem? <laughs> more challenge. But there was also make, all, we do all the mechanical design, we do all the electronics in-house. Um, now you can put the sound back on. So how many have driven their power chair Seen in the pool? Children playing in the water, splashing each other, or going down a water slide. But for some kids, like Sam, water is an obstacle. We definitely avoid water parks because we know there's the ladder scaffold involved. You have to get up to the slide. And also, the rides in the water parks typically be, they just aren't good for someone without balance. So that's just in general water parks a challenge. And being in a power wheelchair makes it even more difficult. These wheelchairs run on electricity, and when water comes in contact with them, the results can be shocking. So how do you build a water park that all kids can enjoy? 
That's the question Gordon Hartman had. He runs the world's first accessible theme park, Morgan's Wonderland in San Antonio. We had to come up with a wheelchair that would uh, allow for it to get wet and still be able to move about. Uh, through the use of someone's uh, ability to uh, use a joystick. That's when he discovered the work of Dr. Rory Cooper at the University of Pittsburgh School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Cooper is world-renowned for numerous patents and inventions when it comes to wheelchair technology. He's dedicated his life to improving assistive devices for people with disabilities. I found Dr. Cooper from the first conversation we had on the phone as a person who really wanted to work hard at ensuring that this idea that we had of developing this chair, which would truly be revolutionary. Gordon and I have the same vision. That's uh, a, a world where all everybody can participate together so that people with and without disabilities are on the same playing field. And the idea is, that, hey, an air motor with air tanks, if it's feasible, may uh, provide with a much lighter power chair uh, much more environmentally friendly that doesn't need to have the batteries replaced. And from that idea, a new chair, short for pneumatic chair, was born. The new chair is powered strictly by compressed air. There's no batteries, so that makes it waterproof. We can recharge it in as little as 10 minutes. Unlike current battery wheelchairs, that could take up to eight hours. It could revolutionize the wheelchair industry. Brandon Daveler, a current graduate student at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences is a researcher studying under Rory Cooper. Their team works out of the human engineering research laboratories where they modeled and built the new chair. The chair that makes a challenging trip to the water park, well, fun. I like to have the freedom to run around. It was rewarding to see just how he lit up and the enjoyment that he got out of going through the sprinklers and the water. He wants to be independent. Quite frankly, we let him go for 30 minutes by himself, and that's what he wants. And Rory thinks children So the exciting thing is those, Brandon actually started his own company called Atomize, and it's, um, so he's, ma he's manufacturing these chairs, and um, those chairs are available at Morgan's Inspiration Island down in San Antonio for free for kids to use. And then just recently, our local grocery store chain, Giant Eagle, has also purchased the scooter versions for people to have a green way to go shopping so you don't have to uh, use battery-powered chairs and have the batteries be disposed of. So I told you that I'm involved in the Paralympics. This is the video we created for the 2016 Paralympics. I just wanted to show you as I wrap up.
Yes, I can. 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 Hey, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Are you ready? I can climb Everest. Yes, I can. I can fight here all night and never rest. Yes, I can. I was just born today. I can go. So if you thought the Paralympics are cool, that's how we started the Paralympic Games. And they actually literally did that drop. You, the, uh, our, so your associate dean for students mentioned the um, trading card. Um, so uh, what's exciting about it is people like Harry made it possible for AT to be recognized as a trading card. So that I could be speaking with you today. So in 2019, AT finally made it on par with Thomas Edison, Nicholas Tesla, and Abraham Lincoln, among others. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. On behalf of the 35th Annual Celebration of the Assistance Technology Conference, we'd like to present you this award and thank you for a brilliant presentation this evening. How about a cheer for Dr. Roy Cooper? Absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you all for being here for this convening session. We'd like to invite you to join us at our reception after, after we uh, adjourn here, and uh, we'll see you around at the conference, okay? Thanks so much for coming.